Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. This spring, we've been walking through uh, the book of Psalms. We began with assorted Psalms. Most of you can probably pick a handful of Psalms that are your favorite. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. You probably have a favorite psalm because there was a particular time, a point in your life when you were in the pit of despair or circumstance overwhelmed you and you heard God's voice in the middle of that psalm. That's how the psalms are are to be used. Poetry, that God can be found in the messiness of life. And we walk through a number of assorted psalms like that. But we've also spent the last four weeks, and we will conclude on Easter next Sunday, seeing that the Psalms are a book also to be read as a whole, with a narrative from beginning to end, predicting the coming of the King. God's king, written in symphonic form, the unfolding of the majesty of the coming of God's very own son. And this morning, we're going to be looking at Psalm 2. I've made many, many references to it. Uh, It's very important. Psalm 2, very important psalm for you to know and to understand because it is about God has consecrated and installed his king. Psalm 2 is fascinating. You may not know that the first two psalms serve in the book as an introduction to the entirety of the book. And as all good introductions, it tells you where the book is going and what is going to unfold. God's coming king. But what's interesting as you read Psalm 2 is how God's king is coming. As I've been teaching over the past three weeks, you will find that God has a mystery up his sleeve that is to be revealed in magnificent form. It doesn't happen according to your expectation that God, as the divine author of history, he is unfolding his plans slowly revealed as time goes forward. Now, I tell you all of that because it's very possible for you to read, and you should be able to read Psalm 2 and think of the normal Davidic king and how a David king would read this psalm and understand it. You see, God had given David a promise in 2 Samuel 7. And you actually see that language That is repeated here in this psalm. In 2 Samuel 7, right? I will be a father to you and to your descendants, and you will be a son to me. That's picked up here again whenever it says uh, in 2.7, he said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Okay, Read in the normal ebb and flow of the son of God as a Davidic title, to the king, just as it was given to Israel, so it's given to the king that he has a special, unique relationship with God as the son of God, that specific title. But as we've also seen over the past three weeks, that the Davidic king falls short way short, that Israel falls short, that there's this climactic moment in the middle of the book of Psalms, Psalms 89, where the exclamation is, where are your promises? Where is the Davidic line? Because Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple has been burned to the ground and the Davidic line has been slain. Where are your promises, O God? And so what we're going to do this morning in light of of the movement of the book. That is that God is unfolding in Psalm 110 and 118 that his son is the eternal one who is coming, an eternal king that's been promised from eternity past. He is the one who's coming. He is the one that it's all pointing to in anticipation. We're gonna go back this morning and we're gonna read Psalm 2 through that lens. 
the way that the apostles would read it. And you're going to see, it's going to absolutely explode off the page. Okay? So if you would stand, please, in honor of the reading of God's word, Psalm 2, the New Testament tells us this is a psalm written by King David. I'm going to be reading out of the New American Standard. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take their counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Pause real quick. You must understand that word anointed there. Okay, the Hebrew word for Messiah, the Greek word for Christ, anointed. It's the title for the Davidic king. So there, there, the kings of the earth are taking their stand against God and against his anointed. Saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. But he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king. Put that in your mind. I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Kiss the sun with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Sorry, I apologize. Worship the sun with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun that he may not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. You may be seated. Would you pray with me? Our heavenly father, As we come to your word this Palm Sunday, as we remember that almost 2,000 years ago, your son entered into Jerusalem and presented himself as the long-awaited king, may you teach us, may you convict our hearts, may you allow us to see his kingship, his majesty, his magnificence, and that we all across this room would bow the knee and kiss the sun. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. It is the Sunday morning before the Passover, and Jesus is finally ready for his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and to present himself as king. You see, up until this point, he has been very careful to distance himself from the title Messiah, this anointed one used of the promised Davidic king. Not because he's rejecting the title or because he's confused about who he is, but rather the time had not yet come. A number of times through the Gospels, Jesus healed someone and then would warn them, do not tell them who I am. John chapter 6, Jesus perceiving that they were intending to come and to take him by force to make him king, he slipped through their grasp and he went off on his own. After Peter's confession, who do people say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ There's that title. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus warned them, his disciples, tell no one that I am the Christ. But now the time has come. And Jesus will enter Jerusalem, led by the spirit of God, 
a time rooted in eternity past, he is ready to present himself as the long-awaited king. When you pay attention to the details of Jesus' triumphal entry, there is no doubt that the sovereign king of kings is orchestrating his very own coronation. He and his disciples rise early from Bethany. It's about a two-mile journey into Jerusalem. They will stop at Bethpage, a small remote village on the side of the Mount of Olives, where he will acquire a donkey. Jesus has two of his disciples go ahead to retrieve a young male donkey called a colt. He had never been ridden. And Matthew tells us that he will need his mother to accompany him. Jesus tells his disciples, just go untie the two donkeys. And if the owners ask you, hey, what's going on? Simply say, the Lord has need of them. The disciples find it just as he says. The owner gives no objection. It's the first time Jesus uses the title Lord of himself. And he is in complete control. Before I narrate the scene of the triumphal entry, It would help you if I called attention to a couple very important Old Testament passages. You see, in 1 Kings chapter 1, when David chooses Solomon to be his successor, you know what David does? He places Solomon on David's very own donkey. At that time, David rode a donkey. He did not ride a horse. Later kings would ride a horse. But David rode a donkey. And he takes Solomon and he parades him all through Jerusalem so that everyone would know Solomon has been anointed king. There's another really important passage you need to know. And that is in 2 Kings 9.13. In the ancient world, A king's coronation consisted of the people, the crowd, taking off their garments and laying them down in front as a sign of honor and respect. 2 Kings 9, 13. Then they hurried and each man took his garment and placed it under him on the bare steps and blew a trumpet saying, Jehu is king. Descending from the Mount of Olives, making his way into Jerusalem, the day has finally arrived. Behold your king. The crowd gathers and begins to grow. They have taken off their garments and formed for Jesus a saddle as he rides upon the young colt. They have also taken off their garments, and Matthew tells them they lay them in front of him in a procession along with palm branches before him. The excitement grows. You see, there's no mistaking the royal procession. This is a direct fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The crowd is a frenzy with excitement. They begin to chant Psalm 118. Do you remember last week as I walked through Psalm 118 and I said, and we walked through the procession of open up the gates, right? That the king of glory may come in, that that there would be this procession back to the temple. The crowd begins to chant Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. 
God save us. Luke even says that during the chant, they switch from blessed is he to blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The Jewish leaders see all that's taking place. They become angry, irate. They begin to rebuke the crowd and come to Jesus and warn him, you must stop them. And Jesus' reply, this moment is so important. This moment has been written from eternity past. This very day is so important that if they do not cry out, the rocks will cry out in their place because the king is here. The entire city is astir as he enters the temple courtyard. He flips over tables, driving out the money changers. Imagine the crowd. As he presents himself right there in the middle of the temple courtyard, he begins to heal the blind and the lame. And the children begin to sing again, Hosanna to the son of David. Everything is unmistakable as the king has planned his coronation. The chief priests and scribes, seeing all that's taken place, become indignant. The king has presented himself, but he is about to become the rejected cornerstone. Four days later, they have conspired with Judas to betray him. They capture him in the garden and they bring him back before the Sanhedrin for an emergency trial under the cover of darkness. They cannot get any charge to stick with any credibility. And finally, the high priest looks at him and demands, tell us plainly, are you the Christ? Are you the son of God? Yes, I am. Do you realize those are the final charges? Those are the charges that get him killed. Because he presented himself and he said, I am the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus is repeatedly mocked and beaten as a king. A crown of thorns twisted upon his head. A purple robe draped around him. The Sanhedrin goes to Pilate with the charges. He says he's the king. Therefore, he must oppose Caesar. Pilate hands him over to Herod, who again mocks him as king and sends him back to Pilate. Pilate after having him scourged, presents him to the crowd with a crown of thorns upon his head, with a, with a purple robe draped around him, presents him to the crowd and says, behold your king. To which the crowd replies, we have no king but Caesar. And so the sign above his head reads, Listing the official charges reads, King of the Jews. As he hung upon the cross, they mocked him, saying, if you are the Messiah, save yourself. (laughs) He saved others, but he couldn't save himself. And the irony 
is that the only king who could save himself is being mocked for not doing so so that he could save the very ones who nailed him to the tree. The king is dead, buried, written off as a fraud by all who mocked him and killed him. The disciples sit afraid and confused. They do not yet see that he was destined to be the rejected cornerstone. You see, but God wasn't finished installing his king. Because early Sunday morning, the dead king got up. He got up and he presented himself to the women and to the disciples to the 12, to Peter, to James, his brother, to large groups of disciples. And at one point, more than 500 saw him. And on his final appearance, he gathered his 12 there on a mountain in Galilee. He gathered them together and he said, all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then just as Daniel 7 predicted, he rode upon the clouds and he rode up into heaven and approached the throne of God where there the Father said to the Son, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. You must understand at this point the king has been installed on On the throne. Do you see it? Long anticipated. The words long written down. God's unfolding plan. To install the king. His son. On Mount Zion. In the heavenly Jerusalem. Now we've got to reread Psalm 2. You've got to reread it. Because this is how the apostles read it. And you've got to see the way this text explodes. We'll take them in sections. Listen to the first three verses. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and their rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast their cords from us. The apostles looked and they saw Pilate and Herod and the Sanhedrin and the scribes and the priests. Jewish and Gentile leaders all taking their stand against God's anointed king. But he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. You see, God has predicted, God has orchestrated, God has presented, God has installed his king, the crucified king on earthly Zion and the reigning king in the heavenly Zion. In Acts chapter four, after Jesus' death and resurrection, Peter and John, they would routinely go to the temple courtyard and they would preach, they would preach in the name of Jesus. And in fact, God allowed a, 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 a a lame beggar who had been there from, from birth, he had been lame from birth, God allowed them to heal him right there on the spot. There's this miracle that occurs and suddenly the Sanhedrin knows they've got to do something. They've got to take charge of this situation because Peter and James, they keep coming back and they keep telling everyone of this Jesus. So they arrest Peter and John. They gather them together and they warn them. With as much fear, with as much intimidation as they can possibly give, you must stop 
telling and preaching the name of Jesus. And James and Peter, sorry, John and Peter go back to the disciples. They're filled with fear. They've, they've seen Jesus crucified. And they run back to the disciples in the upper room in this small, intimate setting. But they begin to pray and quote Psalm 2. This song. Read it. Acts 4. This song. They open up their Bibles. They see it. They're like, look, they're taking their stand. But, but God has installed his king. God has installed his king. They read this psalm. Look at verse six. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Mount Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. The long awaited promised son of David. Verse eight, ask of me. And I will surely give the nations as your inheritance. The gospel will go to the ends of the earth. Isn't that the last thing Jesus said? The great commission? The gospel will go to the ends of the earth. All authority has been given. Go, make disciples. The gospel will go to the ends of the earth. Every tribe, tongue, and nation will have people standing at the end of time presented before Jesus as his. You shall break them with a rod of iron and you shall shatter them like earthenware. The king who came as a lamb now sits in the heavenlies as the lion of Judah. He rules, he reigns, and he is coming back. In light of that context, 10 through 12, come to the culmination. Kiss the sun. That means bow down and take and kiss the sun. In light of all that God has done, kiss the sun. And the apostles, they read Psalm 2. They're in that situation in Acts chapter 4 with the intimidation of all the leaders saying, you better not speak again in the name of Jesus. But the apostles, they open Psalm 2. They begin to read it. And they begin to see, wait a second. Look at all that has taken place. It's happening exactly the way God said. Rulers and leaders, kings of the earth are taking their stand against his anointed, but his anointed has been installed. The God of heaven laughs, he mocks, he knows that his king will rule and will reign, that the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. And they gather together in that upper room and they begin to pray and the Holy Spirit falls the room is shaken and they are filled with boldness to proclaim the good news of Jesus. We cannot be silent because our king has been stalled upon the throne. What a magnificent text. Listen to the words long written down. Two quick points of application. The first is that you and I are called to boldness. There are so many times in the New Testament when the church faces persecution and they're filled with fear. Right? It's natural. Some of us are timid by nature, but fear. Fear of losing their jobs, fear of being ridiculed, fear of being thrown into prison, even death. And repeatedly, you can see New Testament disciples begging God for boldness. They know they need boldness. That our natural tendency is to shrink and to be quiet, to not tell the good news. And so they beg God for boldness. 
And hear what you can see in Acts 4. Hear what you can see is that boldness is tied to the fact of being able to open your Bible and read and say, wait a second. A thousand years ago, God wrote this down and predicted it. And it's coming true right before our very eyes. God is on his throne. God has installed his king. Surely I can trust him with my life. And I pray that you can see that this morning and that it makes you bold. So who has God placed in your life right now who needs to know Jesus like you know him? And will you pray for boldness, that you would not shrink back to protect your own reputation, but rather this magnificent unfolding that you continue to see before your eyes, right there in your Bible, all of it pieced together over hundreds, thousands of years, God's coming son would stir up a courage to tell others the good news. And secondly, friend, if you are here this morning and you don't quite know what to do with Jesus, you don't know what to think about him, maybe you've been exploring and you're still formulating thoughts. Maybe you've dipped your toe in the water just to touch it and taste it a little bit. Maybe you kind of believe, but you don't want to really base your whole life off this stuff. I mean, you don't want to be seen as one of those all in kind of crazy all out for Jesus people. Can I implore you with everything inside of me? Come. Come. Come taste and see. That the Lord is good. That he is a good king. I give personal testimony. All across this room we give testimony. He has been so good as my king. And he invites you. He is patiently calling you. He has been patiently working in your life so that you would see him and so that you would hear his voice and you are invited to come and to kiss the son and find eternal life. But please make no mistake Your recognition of him as king is not what makes him king. You see, Jesus is the king, whether you kneel before him or not. The same one who rode into Jerusalem gentle and mounted on a donkey will return riding a white horse, the King of kings and Lord of lords. The same one who knelt and lifted a prostitute's head and called the little children unto himself is the same one from whom all men will hide their face as they run into the caves upon his return. The same one who is mocked as king with a crown of thorns and a purple robe draped around him is the same king who judges every deed, every thought, every word spoken on the final day. You see, make no mistake, he is king. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess The question is, will you freely, right now, 
surrender and bow the knee and will you kiss the son? With every head bow and every eye closed, if you are here this morning and you have never placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you have never bowed the knee and kissed the Son, would you do so right now? Would you call out to him? He is patient. He is waiting. He is king. Would you freely bow? Would you say to him, Jesus, in my sin, I fall short of your glory and I have no ability to stand before a holy God. But you have come as my king and died in my place on the cross and resurrected. And I ask you right now, because I place all of my faith in you, to forgive my sins and to make me new. And I will make you king as you rightfully are. If you are a believer and you have declared him your king, maybe many years ago, would you again, in the quietness of your heart, would you remember who he is? all that he has done. And would you kiss the son? Jesus, you are worthy. You are worthy of all of our praise, of all of our adoration. You are so good. And we love you because you've given us hearts that beat for you. And we bow our knees and we kiss you as our king. It's in your name we pray.